For the last six years, I've been living somewhat of a double life. By day, I've been working at an investment bank in New York and London, and by night, I've been writing modern love stories and pursuing my dreams of being an author. And it might sound like these two worlds, finance and romance, are polar opposites. But what I've realized is that there are actually so many parallels, too many parallels, between how investors approach deal-making with how people today approach dating. And this transactional approach to love is backfiring on us, big time. So let's set the scene. It's Friday night in Manhattan. A 20-something woman leaves her corporate office after a long week, schleps over on the subway to her best friend's apartment. They trade out their business suits for fuzzy bathrobes, pass around the Ben & Jerry's ice cream, and of course, they talk about dating. But if you didn't know that they were talking about love, you might think they were talking about work. Because they say things like, how's your pipeline looking? Yeah, pretty robust. I have three dates lined up this week. I should cut my losses with this guy before I invest any more emotional capital. This relationship is more volatile than cryptocurrency stocks. I should hedge myself with more options in case it doesn't work out. The opportunity cost of a second date is just too high. I wish I could just find my soulmate and close the deal already. End scene. Now, I'm allowed to poke fun here because I myself have had this kind of conversation many times, as have my wonderful friends and many women and men I've spoken with while writing my modern love novels. And I know I'm in Ireland today and I'm speaking to a group of different ages and occupations. And maybe you're thinking, thanks, but I don't think this really applies to me if I'm not in my 20s in New York and working in finance. And maybe you haven't even used these exact words or economic terms before. But I would challenge you to think, have you ever applied any kind of business principle to your relationships? From making a checklist, a cost-benefit analysis, playing the numbers game, any of that. So today, we will go through why we do this, how we do it and how it's hurting us, and ending on a brighter note, how we can turn things around and set ourselves up for real success in love. I'm still pinching myself that I get to do a TED Talk about love in this beautiful country and this beautiful university. So thank you so much for having me and we will have some fun today. All right, so first up, why do we approach dating with such a business mindset? A couple reasons. For one, if we do work a corporate job, then the blurring of lines between our professional and personal lives make it natural that the jargon and the concepts from the day kind of seep over into our love lives. It's this work takeover effect that's becoming increasingly prevalent. But we might even perceive an advantage in this, because if our business skills are helping us climb the corporate ladder, who's to say they shouldn't give us a leg up on the romantic ladder? And the second reason that we approach dating like deal-making is a deeper emotional one. It's a defense mechanism and a way to protect ourselves. And in our dating app culture, when there is so much anonymity and so little accountability, it's understandable that we would want to be putting up these walls and keeping things from feeling so personal and vulnerable if or when we get ghosted or rejected or played. Been there. But instead of outsmarting the system with this pragmatic approach, we're really just outsmarting ourselves. Let's talk through how. So when I joined Wall Street right out of university, I was an investor and I worked on small deal teams. So our job was basically to look at a bunch of different companies and figure out which ones would make for good investments. So if we gave them money now, would we make a profit in the long run? And every Monday morning, we would gather in the conference room for a pipeline meeting where we would go around the table and talk about all the different deals we were working on and the status of each one. Enter the deal funnel which is a business concept that shows the different stages of a deal. So the funnel is the widest at the top with the whole universe of potential transactions, and then it narrows down to the bottom to show only the few that end up being completed. And as I was working as an investor by day while writing about love and relationships by night, my Hannah Montana double life, <laughs> I couldn't help but notice, notice and say, hey, what's going on here? 
The modern dating scene has basically just taken this deal funnel and repurposed it into a date funnel. And that is when I knew our love lives were in trouble. So at the top of the funnel, we have sourcing and screening. And as an investor, this means that you take a look at all the different deals in the market and you hone in on the ones that pass your initial checklist. And uh, in our relationships, you know, sourcing can look like swiping furiously through the dating apps, trying to maximize your number of matches until you give your thumb arthritis. <laughs> but as we know from the, from the paradox of choice, more options can actually lead to less satisfaction and even decision paralysis. And the way that we're screening dates isn't great either. We apply these really superficial filters on the dating apps, things like height or ethnicity. And on top of that, we manually screen for prestigious universities or movie star good looks. The problem is that compatibility does not adhere to a checklist. And we're missing out on people who might be wonderful for us because we're approaching dating in such a narrow, business-minded way. The next stage of the deal funnel, or the date funnel, is the due diligence. So as an investor, this is where I would crunch the numbers, build the financial models, and put together the return on investment calculations for a deal. And in our relationships, due diligence can look like assessing whether somebody fits into our five or 10 year life plan, and overanalyzing every little thing about them, from their future earnings potential to the investment risk of dating someone with divorced parents. But models and metrics cannot predict the future of our relationships. And romantic visibility does not work the same way as revenue visibility. Would we even really want to be with somebody who's nothing but a robotic output in an Excel spreadsheet? And more than that, this is a selfish mindset because by evaluating the return on investment, we're saying, what's in it for me? What am I getting out of this? And yes, I'm a hopeless romantic, but I believe that love is a partnership, an equal give and take, and not something to profit from. The next stage of the funnel is the committee vote. So at work, I would summarize all of the due diligence, put it in a big PowerPoint deck, and then our deal team would present that to a five-person investment committee who would vote to either move forward or kill the deal, as it was so compassionately called. And when we start dating somebody, not only do we bring them forth to a committee of friends and family for approval, but increasingly, we are turning to strangers on social media for validation of our relationships. So maybe we post a photo on Instagram with our significant other, and then we feel disappointed, even rejected, if the likes and comments don't come rolling in. It can feel like this social media committee has voted to veto the deal. It brings us farther from our own intuition and our own truth and puts too much weight on other people's opinions. Our love lives should not be consensus driven. The next stage of the funnel is to invest or cut your losses. So by this point, we're pretty far along, have probably already signed a letter of intent, which is a non-binding legal agreement, a bit like getting engaged, but there's still an opportunity to back out before it's official. And as my friends on the Wall Street trading floor will tell you, investors by their nature are always looking to arbitrage options to cut their losses and jump from this stock to that stock in hopes of making more money somewhere else. And this mentality flows into how we think about our, our love lives as well. And it's a case of FOMO, fear of missing out, which is correlated with lower levels of happiness in relationships. We're scared of getting locked in with any one person, any one investment. And rather than work through challenges, we're just so quick to cut our losses at the first sign of trouble. We abort dates with the speed that we abort deals. Always sure something better is right around the corner, so we keep searching, keep swiping, and are never satisfied. But if we do decide to move forward, then we reach the bottom of the funnel, closing the deal. And in the finance world, this is that mad sprint to the finish line, to sign the legal agreements, wire the money, throw the big party, all of that. In our relationships, closing the deal can be compared with getting married. Sometimes that can feel like this finish line that we're sprinting towards. Women especially, if we want to have kids, we can feel like there's a deadline here as we race our biological clocks. And reasons for wanting to get married and start a family can be very good and valid. And I feel them myself, absolutely. 
But stress leads to worse decision making, and if we're so consumed by needing to get love to fit our specific timeline and life plan and force it through this funnel to reach the shiny outcome at the bottom, it can really set us back more than it moves us ahead. So, taken together, applying the business deal framework to dating does not, in fact, lead to fulfilling relationships. This date funnel is actually nothing more than a downward arrow leading into a dark and unhappy place we might call a romantic recession. <laughs> the way we can emerge from this recession is to stop treating love like a commodity and start treasuring it as a connection. To remember that love is not a transactional experience, but rather a transformational one. And if we can bring the heart and humanity back into dating, we can turn this upside down arrow right side up and experience massive gains in our love lives, a new bull market of romance. So what does this look like? Well, it looks like giving somebody a chance, even if they don't fit our rigid filters and criteria set. It looks like giving somebody grace to be human and have a bad day or a bad week, instead of being so quick to kill the deal at the first glimpse of imperfection. It looks like appreciating the person right in front of us, rather than always monitoring the market for a higher performing investment. And rather than feeling like we have to hurry up and close a deal, it looks like letting love breathe on its own timeline. So let's toss out this date funnel and make our heart and intuition our new portfolio managers of our emotional investments. And maybe this mantra of follow your intuition is a bit too touchy-feely for the business world, but that is just fine because the more separation between work and love, the better. It's time to force a breakup between dating and deal-making and cheer each other on as our love lives rally to new highs. Thank you.